Good morning. Hope you guys didn't see that I stepped on something over there, and I hope I didn't break it. <laughs> it is really good to be back with you here at Upstate Church Malden. I think last time I was here it was like January, February. All I remember that it was super cold. And, uh, but it's good to be back with you, not in, in better weather, but it's, it's just good to be with you again. We'll be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. If you want to tap there or turn there, we'll put most of the text for you up on the screen. But I have a, I have a question I want you to ponder uh, just for a moment. When, when I say mighty move of God, what is it that, that comes to your mind? We are often and rightly encouraged to dream big dreams for God and it's obvious that God is, is doing big things here at Upstate Church, uh, getting to do what I do and go around the different campuses and, and preach on occasion, just seeing what the Lord is doing. It, it is really unique, and it is really good. And it's just good for me even to get to reconnect with Ashley Moore. We went to seminary together in another century, and here, uh, decades later, our lives have sort of re reconnected. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. So we do dream big dreams for God, and even as the missionary pioneer, William Carey, said that we ought to ask great, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God, he said. So what are those great things? We use terms. We say like revival or a movement of the Holy Spirit. But what does revival or a great movement of the Holy Spirit, what does that look like? What happens when revival happens? If a mighty move of God broke out in Malden, South Carolina, what would that be like? Well, we have our ideas, and they're usually big. We think of massive gatherings. We think honestly about the first 41 verses of Acts chapter 2, but we probably don't think of the last six. We think of the big, not the small, but we need to think more about the small. Jesus said, on one hand, the kingdom of God is going to come like a great feast. But he also said, the kingdom of God will come like a mustard seed. And that's how Acts chapter 2 works. It moves from the big to the small. 80% of this chapter is huge. It is big, big. And if you rewind just a little bit back to Acts chapter 1, just before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told his, his disciples to wait for the Spirit because when the Spirit came, they would receive power to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes, and boy, is it Big. There is a sound of rushing wind. There are tongues of fire. There are utterances of the Spirit. There is a great, great gathering of people. There's a sermon by Peter that is literally one for the ages. There's a beckoning to repent and be saved and a harvest. 3,000 souls saved in one day. Big, big stuff that never happens again. Not in the book of Acts. Not in the rest of the Bible. From that day forward, from there on out, the work is small. It's small. And our focus passage is small. Just these six verses at the end of chapter 2, a, a little summary, the first of several summaries peppered throughout the book of Acts. It's, it's a description, a description of how the inbreaking of the Spirit would work itself out in the people. How the gospel announced big became a gospel lived small. And this summary tells us the way things were in the first early church and the way things should be in our church. So let's look to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. Here the Bible says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came up every all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. 
Let's pray. Father, we're thankful to gather together this morning as your people, as your church, to exalt you, to worship you, to hear from you, and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray today in these next few moments that you really would open up your word to our eyes and you would open up our eyes to your word by the power of your spirit that we might be changed, that we might grow, that you would be glorified. And these things we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you know, for the past few weeks, we have been using the Apostles' Creed as something of an outline, a format, by which we're going back to the Bible to see uh, what are the basis, basics of the Christian faith? What are the essential things that Christians must believe in order to be a Christian in a, in a substantial kind of way? Uh, the Creed has its roots all the way back to the 3rd century A.D., and it emerged in use among the churches in a time that's not that much different than our own. Sure, they didn't have iPhones and super highways, but they had a lot of confusion in their culture. Uh, they, they had a lot of rancor and polarization in their culture. They had a lot of bad ideas floating out there in their culture. And the church used the creed of saying, we need to be clear. We need to be clear about who we are and what we need to believe. And so they really used the creed to do three things. First of all, to unify the church. This is who we are. This is how we identify ourselves. This is what we believe. Secondly, to teach, to be clear, and to make sure they pass the truth on to subsequent generations. And thirdly, to worship. They viewed the creed and reciting the creed together as an act of worship to God, to bring glory to God and bear, bearing witness to the gospel of Jesus. And today, we arrive to the sixth stanza, stanza, and I'll read the creed up to that point. Now, I know there's a word in here that might jar you a little bit, and, and we will we'll clean it up later, okay? It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins. Now, I want you to notice here that the statement about the church comes right after the statement about the Spirit, and that's on purpose. Where the Spirit moves, the Spirit empowers testimony to the gospel, and where the Spirit empowers testimony to the gospel, a church is born. In the first two chapters of Acts, we see exactly that. The Spirit was given for gospel witness, and gospel witness quickly birthed a church. Just in review, before Jesus ascended, he told the disciples that they would receive power from the Spirit for witness. When the Spirit came, the immediate result was bold witness to the gospel. Jesus crucified and raised for the salvation of all who would believe. And the gospel that was announced big and big crowds believed, quickly small communities formed communities that were simply the practical outworking of the message itself. So I don't want you to see these six verses that we're in today as some sort of really specific blueprint for the church, like a constitution and bylaws. That's, that's not what's happening here. Read it for what it is. This is what it looks like when a big, big gospel is lived out in small and consistent ways. In our passage, we we observe something of this inside-out dynamic. Inside-out, inside-out. Convictions inside the community result in witness to those outside the community, which then produce a harvest of people back into the community. Check, the, check out the pattern. In verse 42, we see inner commitments. Verse 43, outward witness. Verses 44, 45, and 46, inner commitments. Verse 47, outward witness and gospel harvest. So I want to zero in today on those inner commitments, the simple and the small. A church with a big gospel witness is built with simple things, simple commitments. And our text leads us to answer three questions. First, who is a church anyway? 
Who is a church? A church is a gospel community, a community defined by the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I told you, there is a word in the creed that might make us a little squirrely when we hear it. After all, I mean, we're sitting in a Baptist church. All of a sudden, we all said the word Catholic. What, what, what's, what's going on? That's because we associate the word C with a lowercase c with uppercase C, Catholicism, or the Roman Catholic Church. But the word Catholic is actually much older than any church tradition or, or controversy. The word Catholic just means common. Common. The word Catholic just, it refers to, here's what happens when the gospel is preached. Communities of people are formed. And we kind of find these little communities of people everywhere. The, the commonly attended, commonly expressed church. And what we see in Acts is just the first common church. Just the common simple church found in all places and all times. And verse 42 says of this first common church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And the apostles' teaching was simply the sum and the substance of all that Jesus Christ accomplished. Jesus appointed the apostles, and the apostles taught the church in the power of the Spirit. And now we really have a better position insofar as we have the teaching of the apostles preserved for us in, in Holy Scripture. We have it right here, generations later. Listen, teaching the gospel is what gives the church its identity. It defines who we are. Let's fast forward and imagine that today is November the 26th, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, which is college football rivalry day, right? It is the day when you probably lay on the couch and try to watch football but keep falling asleep maybe. But on November the 26th, that day, the South Carolina Gamecocks will travel all the way up to Death Valley for their annual meeting, right? And uh, some of you are thinking annual beating, but annual m meeting. And uh, this, is <clears throat> this is frankly kind of a, a, a divisive issue in the state of South Carolina. Uh, there, there are people who get kind of fussy about this, and maybe you listen to 105.5 The Roar, and it's, it's kind of normal until some Gamecock fan calls in, and it gets... It gets kind of weird, right? You see license plates, house divided, Clemson Paul, Gamecock C thingy, right? All, all that stuff. I want you to imagine on November the 26th, before the game, that Coach Beamer and Coach Swinney get together and they have a meeting. You know, we, we just, we just got to end this rancor. This is too divisive in our state. Man, families are fighting. People fuss all the time. We need to find a way to make this a much more peaceful event. Let's make, it, let's make this a point of unity. Let's make this really, really peaceful. So I'll tell you what. For today, let's have Clemson players wear a Gamecocks helmet, and let's have the South Carolina players wear the Tiger Paul on their helmet. That, that should fix things, right? Right? Would it? No. Imagine the sort of confusion and controversy and outcry that would cause. That sort of thing would cause more problems than it would solve. Why? Because the helmet is the identifier right? The helmet tells you who is who, who's from where, and what they're all about. A gamecock is not a tiger, and a tiger is not a gamecock, and those two different helmets represent two different schools, and two different traditions, and two different histories, and two different people groups, so to speak, and, and all of that. Listen, in the same way, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the helmet, the sticker stuck on the side of the helmet of the church, it defines who we are. It tells our story. It roots our tradition. It determines our future. It is our everything. And without the gospel, the church has nothing. Without the gospel, we are not anything. We don't have anything to say. We don't have anything to offer. The gospel is the definition of who we are. The gospel is what brings the church together. It is our defining purpose, our defining moment, and that's why we are devoted to the teaching of the apostles because that's where we hear the gospel. It is true that all we need is Jesus. It is true that all we need is a resurrected Christ, a resurrected Savior, but we know Jesus. 
And we learn about his message in scripture, the preserved teaching of the apostles here, preached in the church, live here. Live in these pages, breathe in these pages. These pages frame and form and forge our identity as gospel people. That's who we are. But you need to notice, though, that devotion to the apostles' teaching did not stand alone in that early church. It was more than just an academic Bible study, right? They didn't just know things. They did things. And whatever they did, we must do, which brings us to this next question. Well, what do they do? What must the church do? What does the church do? Where they were devoted to the teaching, that's who where they were, and to fellowship. That's what they did. Now, we have sometimes sort of cheapened the idea of fellowship in general, but also in the church. We've kind of reduced the idea of fellowship to uh, getting a cup of coffee, leaning against the counter saying, what's up with you? <clears throat> Just sort of an acquaintance, a, a passers-by sort of thing, small talk. Well, the term for fellowship is the word koinonia. And the word koinonia really indicates much more than simple acquaintance. It indicates close relationship, tight bonds, deep knowledge of each other. The main thrust of the term koinonia is just together, bonded, bounded, tied, together. Koinonia fellowship, close association. Verse 44 sort of walks it out. And all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. This idea of, of the togetherness of the church receives more attention in the text than any other feature. How did you know they were the church? They clung to the teaching, and those people are always together. Together. What does koinonia, what does togetherness, what does fellowship look like? Well, first of all, it looks like, frankly, eating. It looks like food. Notice they were devoted to the breaking of bread in chapter 42. And in chapter 46, again, they broke bread in each other's homes and they received their food with joy. They were eating and they were happy about eating. And this was actually a sign and signal of their identity of the church. Now we know Luke wrote the book of Acts. It is the same Luke who wrote Luke's gospel. And you might hear a ringing of that phrase, the breaking of bread, the breaking of bread. In Luke chapter 24, just after Jesus' resurrection, he's walking to Emmaus with some of his disciples, and he's trying to explain how all of the scriptures point to him, and they kind of don't get it. They don't even recognize that it's him. And finally, they get to where they're going. They sit down around a table, and when he broke bread they recognized him because they remembered just a couple days earlier on the night before he was betrayed he sat with his disciples and <clears throat> broke bread right I am not suggesting that what we see here in Acts chapter 2 is some full orbed doctrine of the Lord's Supper that's not what I'm saying but what we do see here is the Lord's Supper in its seminal form in its seed form, a people devoted to one another because they're devoted to a Savior, and that commitment is displayed around a table. Look, it's an awesome thing when you gather with friends to eat, isn't it? In fact, that's kind of what we do. We don't just have people over to play Monopoly or whatever. We have people over and we eat. In fact, it's almost kind of strange to get together with people and not eat. It's just a sign of fellowship. Maybe it's just because we live in South Carolina. I don't, I don't know. But it's beautiful when we do that. Listen, it is awesome when the church does it. And it's awesome when the church does it because every time we eat and drink, we can think, one day, one day we'll do this with Jesus. One day our fellowship will be made complete. One day we will eat and drink with him and his kingdom. That's incredible. And that's what the early church was portraying. And that's what we portray as well. The early church looks like eating. The church looks like eating. And it looks like praying. Praying. Specifically here, it's the prayers. They were devoted to 
the prayers. And the definite article likely indicates something specific. Not, not just random occasional prayers. Sure, they did this. But specific, intentional times of focused prayer. Praying together. Approaching the throne of grace with confidence for each other, begging for the persistent move of the gospel, praying for bold witness, pleading for those who are suffering, celebrating God's presence among us to the end of the age, confident that if we pray, he is able to meet our needs. He told us to pray, so let's pray. It looks like food, it looks like praying, and in verse 45, it looks like caring. Caring. Notice this verse, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, I'll just kind of say this. In our modern-day world of political rancor and polarization, sometimes we can get a little sensitive about this verse because we think, is, is the New Testament endorsing you know, socialism or something like that, we get involved in all of these economic, political theory stuff. Reading this text in light of contemporary economic theories is unfair to the text. Uh, this tax and this practice came around far before any of those ideas were formalized or, or certified. So sometimes you'll hear people reading this text through political lenses. Don't do it. Take this text for what it is and what it means. These people cared deeply about each other. Deeply enough that their stuff was never more important than their friends. Ever. And whatever they had, they held loosely. And if it meant selling something to meet the needs of a brother or sister in Christ, you just do it. That's not a question. That's not a decision. That's just something you do when you love each other like brothers and sisters, right? One of the biggest blessings to, to me and my wife is that our children, ages 18 and age 15, they are exceptionally close. This is it's still crazy to me. I would never do this with my brother when we were teenagers. Our kids walk together every night. It's the wildest thing. They share everything together. And, and, and look, if one of them has a problem, the other one doesn't mind giving up whatever to help because that's my brother. That's my sister. That's exactly how we should think about each other in church. We are siblings. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. So be together. Just be together. Verse 46 continues the theme. They very much saw, when it talks about them going to the temple together, they very much saw their newfound faith in Christ as the completion of their Jewish heritage. But even while they honored that Jewish heritage, even that they did together. They walked to and from the temple together, so their togetherness was not constrained to their meetings of worship as the church. Their togetherness was just a characteristic of their lives. They were simply together. So be together. Root your life in the community of the local church. It is here where you will find encouragement and caring and urging to go on with the gospel. Be together. I cannot ever forget the account I read of a 19th century pastor in Chicago, Illinois. It's a long time ago, big city. But there was a prominent citizen in the city who was also a member of his church, but he wasn't very active. He didn't show up for much. He was just sort of marginal. So the pastor decided he would go visit this man. It was a cold winter day, and they sat down in his living room, and there's a fire blazing in the fireplace. And, of course, the man offered the same excuses that sometimes we do, right? Uh, well, I'm just really busy. I've got a lot going on, kids, da, 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 you know, the line of things. And the pastor didn't really respond to any of that directly. Instead, he, he, he walked over to the fireplace, and he took the tongs, and he pulled a single coal from the fire and, and laid it there on the, on the hearth. And the two men just watched as that single coal began to cool and burn out while the coals that were together in the fireplace stayed hot. And finally the man said, I think I understand. Do we? Do we understand that? Gospel fires are forged together. 
from the beginning to the end of the scriptures, we are called, yes, individually to have faith in Christ, but to live in Christ is also to be among a people. God is saving a people for himself, and he wants his people to be together because together is how we grow. Together is where we find encouragement. Do we understand? By being together, by being the gospel community, and doing the things the community does, we begin to see then what it is that unifies the church. If the gospel brings us together, what is it that holds us together? Why do we stay together? Well, it is to do the work of the gospel. It is to do the mission. The mission unifies the church. Verse 47 The last verse of the passage is something of the summary of the summary. And notice what you see in this passage. Their identity together in Christ was marked by joy. They were happy together. It was marked by a good reputation. They thought well of each other, and therefore other people, even on the outside, thought well of them. They might not have agreed with them, but they thought well of them, right? And they, and they had growth. Day by day, the people did their thing. And day by day, God added to them. Day by day, people were being saved. Here's what this church knew. They knew that the big thing was to just keep doing the small things. That's the big thing. In summer of 2016, my family, Jesse, the kids, uh, we went to, I can't say the name of the country, but it was in Asia uh, where missionary work isn't allowed, but we had some friends there who uh, were kind of missionaries. And uh, so we went to visit them and, and spend time with them and, and really just to be together with old friends. This is a place where missionary work isn't allowed, and even being associated with a church comes with a whole series of, of risks. Um, nothing they do can be big. Nothing. It has to be small. Uh, no advertising, <clears throat> no billboards, no radio ads, um, no Facebook pages, uh, no live streaming. Uh, they can't have Easter egg hunts for the kids on Easter. No big productions at Christmas. They meet in homes, and so they have to trickle in really slowly and trickle out really slowly so as not to draw attention. They have to meet in different homes every week so as not to create observable patterns. Uh, They can sing. They sing together, but not very loud. They have to sing in a hushed way. No guitars, no drums. In some ways, that may sound really discouraging, but that was probably the mightiest church I have ever seen in my life. Um, people were there from across different countries and ethnicities of Asia. Some of them were from ethnic groups that have hated each other with a kind of hatred that goes back a thousand years or more. But here, they loved each other. Some of them had been ostracized by their families for coming to faith in Jesus. And these people together who met every week, that had become their family their only family. That was it. So what does that kind of church do? They ate. They prayed. They cared for each other. It was just striking to me what they, what they would do. The single mom who's not there that Sunday, who's going to check on her? Who's going to make sure things are okay? The older gentleman, is he getting his meds? The children over there, are, are they getting the kind of literature they need to be educated? We're started, we've been working on this clean water project over there in the next village. Can we show up Tuesday? Can we keep, can we keep doing that? Um, baptism, baptism can't be a big show. We're going to have to, got a couple folks we want to baptize, but uh, y'all, we've got to keep this really, on, really obscure. Can, can we meet at 5 in the morning on Thursday? Does that work for everybody? Right? And then they clung to the teaching, absorbing this book, because not everybody had one on their coffee table, absorbing this book like a treasure. In fact, they they kind of asked me to speak the Sunday we were there. You know, here's, here's an American pastor, and he's got a couple of Bible degrees. Maybe he has something to say to us. I have to tell you, 
I have never in my life felt so much as though I had nothing to say. I had nothing to say to them because they were telling me how to think about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were showing me what the real thing looks like, and they were showing me that in these simple things, the gospel marches on. And indeed, the Lord was adding to their number day by day by day by day. Listen, the most powerful witness to the Christian faith in the world today are simply people who do it. People who persist in the small ways. It's not the way we would imagine it, right? If we were designing the church, if I were designing gospel mission, I want big, man. I want fireworks. I want it huge. I want stadiums. I want crowds. But God has a way of inverting our wisdom, doesn't he? The big, big gospel moves small. It moves small. Let me tell you this. Love the small. The small, consistent patterns of the gospel. Be devoted to the small. Because in the small, the gospel grows big. It grows big. Jesus himself modeled this for us. We're going to share in a few moments the the Lord's Supper. Jesus modeled this for us. On the night before he would finish a cosmic act of of reconciliation on the cross and thereafter rupture the fabric of the universe by a resurrection, there's never been a bigger event than the cross and the resurrection. What did he do the night before? Small band of folks, a small room upstairs, a small table, and a small meal. And that little meal meant everything to him. He said, eagerly, I have desired to eat this meal with you. And then it meant everything to them. And it's come to mean everything to us. As we gather, a small piece of bread, a little cup, in this gathering, in this room, When we eat and we drink about the small ways that the gospel came to us and the small ways that we are walking out the gospel as a church, we think about the day when it will come really big, right? We think about that great, great feast when we will eat and drink anew with him and his kingdom. But until then, he says, remember me. Eat and drink in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Our host team will spread the elements, and we will share the meal. Father, we thank you that you are the God who speaks and shows. You're the God who calls us in small ways to a big, big gospel. Help us to remember you until you come again. In this meal, in this bread, in this cup, remind us that you are with us to the end of the age. You have accomplished everything on our behalf so that we might be right with God. You are coming again to make things new, and we will share a kingdom with you forevermore. Amen.
Matthew's Gospel, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Scripture says, And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. It has been so good for us to be together this morning. It's been a privilege for me to be with you today. God bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. You're dismissed.